I'm shocked that people are not panicked about what this disease is going to do to the country or to their families. It's going to sink uh, the healthcare economy and in turn sink the national economy. He's just like, who am I? I don't understand. It will take us down. This disease will take us down. We have a chance to avoid that. But to do so, we have to fund the research to find the cure. Why Every Minute Counts. This live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS for Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff with Hawaii News Now. Former lady Nancy Reagan referred to the illness suffered by former President Ronald Reagan as the truly long, long goodbye. In the United States and Hawaii today, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death, more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. As our population ages, the cost of caring for those with Alzheimer's and other dementias is projected to reach more than $1 trillion over the next 30 years. And compared to the billions spent on research for cancer and heart disease, Alzheimer's research is significantly underfunded. Tonight, Insights on PBS Hawaii explores why every minute counts in finding a cure for Alzheimer's. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on our PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guest. Christine Payne is the executive director for the Alzheimer's Association Aloha Chapter. She manages all of the chapter's activities within the state of Hawaii. Dr. Corey Liao is the director of Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience, Hawaii's leading and first multidisciplinary neuroscience center. The center has taken the lead in a global effort to find a disease-modifying drug for Alzheimer's dementia. Dr. Kamal Masaki is a professor and chair of the Department of Ger Geriatric Medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. She's worked with aging research for the past 22 years and is board certified in internal medicine and geriatric medicine. And Jennifer Jungle, it unexpectedly became a full-time caregiver when her mother was diagnosed with mid-stage dementia last August. She raised two kids and had a successful career in the mainland before taking an early retirement to return to Hawaii to care for her mother. And Jennifer Jungle, let me, let me start with you. Just what stage are you at in terms of d dealing with your mom's illness? And just give me a real quick look at what it's like for you every day. Um, well, it, it's a 24 hour job. In fact, at night now she's been waking up the last couple of weeks. I have a bed alarm. So it's kind of like having a kid. I get up a couple of times every night. Um, I'm blessed now to have a caregiver that comes over four hours every morning to relieve my husband and I. But it's 24 hours for both of us to take care of one of her. Okay, Dr. Masaki, could you give me a sense of what is Alzheimer's versus other dimensions. When we talk about Alzheimer's, it's a very scary word. Uh, what, does it, what is it? What does it do to the brain? So let me start out with what's dementia. Dementia is basically a problem with memory or thinking that's bad enough that it affects your functioning. So it's basically people who have memory problems or other thinking problems, and it's actually affecting their lives, the interaction with their family and friends, or if they're still working, it affects their functioning on their job. There are many types of dementia, and Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. There are other types as well, things like vascular dementia, which is related to strokes, or Parkinson's disease, or other diseases of the brain can also cause a dementia syndrome. So I guess what you're saying is dementia is not always Alzheimer's, but does Alzheimer's always lead to dementia, Dr. Liao? I mean, is, is that sort of an automatic thing that happens with Alzheimer's, and what's going on there? Well, what we understand uh, about Alzheimer's, when we look at the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's, we see several things. First thing is we see shrinkage of the brain. The brain tends to, the brain cells tend to die and the volume loss. Another thing that we look at the brain is uh, we see hallmarks of Alzheimer's. We see plaques, you know, the amyloid plaques, as well as we see, we see tau tangles on the brain. So there are several things that we see happening in the brain, uh, both at the microscopic and also microscopic levels. Um, uh, Christine Payne with the Alzheimer's Association, is this something that's predictable or is it something that you can spot early or is it really a challenge to see this developing in people? How do we know if we're likely to get it? Well, I think there's a number of, of different signs that you can look for and we have a 
know the 10 warning signs that's available on our website that can give um, your viewers more information about the, the different signs. But definitely, I think when it comes to impacting daily life is when you realize, okay, I need to go in and, and see if a physician to get a diagnosis because there's a lot of things that also mimic dementia but aren't necessarily a form of dementia. Is diagnosis a big issue? I believe it is um, and I think that a lot of the families that we see um, come into the office and will say you know my loved one has been on this certain medication so we assume that they may have dementia but we've never been given a formal diagnosis and so we're not quite sure or they'll say well we've seen some of the the warning signs that you're you know you talk about but we don't have a diagnosis and so how can we go about and get one you know uh, Jennifer Drungo with your mom um, how did, you know, she, as I understand, she has a vascular dementia. How did it come on? Was, was there a stroke and then it happened, or was it different from that? How did you realize what was going on? I knew for about a year and a half I had been trying to fax uh, communication with her primary care doctor because my mom would not sign HIPAA form. She was very independent. Um, things like she had lost 15 pounds within a year. My brother saw her going the wrong way down H3. My, but my mom driving, insists, I'm yes, <laughs> <laughs> over on the Kaneohe side. So, um, and then I, I arrived August 7th for what I thought was a three week trip here to take her to a geriatric psychiatrist. She was diagnosed with mid stage dementia, put on some medication, and I was told she can't live alone. And then I didn't know what to do. So I convinced her to come back to uh, Chicago with me, but I contacted the Alzheimer's Association, both their hotline, which is wonderful, and the local contacts. And that's where I learned, really, she needed to be tested. And ironically, we went to Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience, and that's where she got tested. And I know she's got vascular dementia. I know it's far progressed. Um, and so it's really helped me put some framework around understanding this. Let me understand the, the progression um, and uh, either of the doctors. The progression, is it the same with most people? Is it different for vascular dementia or Alzheimer's? And is the, is the deterioration preventable, uh, predictable? It's not totally predictable. We do see some patterns though. In general, Alzheimer's disease tends to be a very slow progression. Vascular dementia tends to progress a little bit faster than that, but even within Alzheimer's disease, you can have a completely unpredictable progression. So some people can have it and live with it for 20, even 25 years or more, mm. and it progresses extremely slowly. Other people can progress within two or three or four or five years. The average between diagnosis and death is about eight to 10 years for Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Okay, let me uh, take a look at some statistics we have for Hawaii specific. And these are pretty striking numbers uh, from what I've seen. Uh, I think that we have a graphic that shows something like 27,000 uh, in 2017, 27,000 patients uh, with Alzheimer's. This is people over 65. Mm -hmm. uh, that's projected to get from to 29,000 by 2020 and 2025, 35,000. Um, Christine Payne, um, what do these numbers tell us about what's gonna be happening in Hawaii? So I think what the numbers illustrate is that the uh, number of people affected by the disease is gonna greatly increase between now and 2025, and so that's just eight years away. So it's about almost a 30% increase in the number of individuals with the disease. And then when you consider the number of caregivers who are also impacted by the disease, um, it's, it's basically a public health epidemic. Yeah, we're gonna go into caregivers in just a moment. Dr. Liao, a quick question is what, with the ethnic groups in Hawaii, and I know you study different ethnicities, is there a difference between ethnic groups? Is there one ethnic group that's more likely to have dementia than another? Well, we know that the Asian population tends to have a little higher incidence of vascular dementia because of the high incidence of hypertension. Uh, the Caucasian population tends to uh, 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 lean towards Alzheimer's, you know, so obviously Hawaii, we, we have a mixture, you know, so, uh, and, and uh, just to jumping into what Jennifer said, uh, you know, the other thing, important thing is um, there are different aspects of care that is not just the, 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 the memory loss, but it's the behavior and, and all, all other things, you know, so I, I think it's really uh, uh, important that she brought up the issue, you know, having different kinds of doctors besides neurologists, you know, uh, bringing in the geriatrician, bringing in the psychologist, and uh, just because this is such a different uh, disease with so many different facets, you know, 
And well, a good point, and it's uh, interesting to see uh, specialists saying, got to talk to other specialists too. I think that's unusual. <laughs> we need all the help. <laughs> sure, now we're gonna talk a little bit more about this documentary. PBS will post this documentary, the national documentary, Every Minute Counts, with tonight's edition of Insights. You'll find both programs at pbsy.org by tomorrow morning. We have a clip now from the national program that clearly spells out the human toll this disease is taking on our country and the world. This morning it took the first three hours being up before she started to recognize me. And I don't know what to do. I'm, I, I do lose my patience. We're, we're trying, we're trying, but it's, you know, it's, it's all a little overwhelming. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia and the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. She went to work one time with her clothing totally inside out. There are no effective treatments and no known way to prevent it. And the epidemic is projected to grow with stunning speed. Alzheimer's is the biggest epidemic we have in this country because our lifespan has far outpaced our health span. As we're living much longer than our health can keep up with. Already, we see over 5 million Americans living with this disease, um, and those numbers are projected to just skyrocket uh, as the baby boomers age and enter the age at higher risk. So we're looking at a tsunami of, of Alzheimer's disease in, in America. And somebody else in the family, in most instances, has the disease as well because they have to take care of the person. So that could be upwards of 25 or 30 million people whose principal life's mission is just dealing with Alzheimer's. Some of the questions, a couple of quick questions for viewers have come in already and uh, one goes to the ethnic issue. Why do residents of Okinawa have a lower rate of Alzheimer's? I don't know if that's necessarily true. Is there any research tying MSG or other additives to our food to Alzheimer's traits or systems? Uh, Dr. Liao, I'll let you bite on those. Um, I, I think, uh, as you know, Okinawa is one of the blue zone. You know, uh, it has. Uh, we also know that Alzheimer's has a lot to do with lifestyle. You know, besides ge strong genetic factors, uh, we also understand that, uh, for example, I, uh, you can't change your gene. I always tell my patient, I can make you younger. I can't change your gene, but you can change, make some lifestyle modification. You know, to um, there is a strong head to heart connection. Right now, we know that whatever is good for the heart will be good for the head too. So, lowering your cardiovascular risk factors, lowering the high blood pressure, you know, all those are good. Regular exercise, you know, those are good, uh, especially aerobic exercise. And uh, certain diet would also benefit, um, you know, also has been proven to lower the risk of Alzheimer's. Uh, the two particular are Mediterranean diet, you know, uh, with very little red meat. Um, you know, uh, those are very good for our patients. Olive oil and garlic is what I remember. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, just to be more specific though, and uh, maybe Dr. Basaki, uh, is there any research tying MSG, is there anything that can trigger or make it worse other than the general dietary factors he was talking about? I haven't heard anything about MSG, uh, and I don't know if anybody studied it. Uh, I do know that certain healthy diets are also good for the brain, just as they're good for the heart. I think most of the research right now is going on with the Mediterranean diet mm -hmm. and showing that having a good diet all you, through your life, not just in old age, but all through your life, could be protective for the brain as well as for the heart. Uh, Jennifer, um, in, in terms of your own family, uh, when this hit your family, did you first ask, well, what did I do wrong? Or what did she do wrong? I mean, did, did you look for, why you were at fault and have you had to deal with that issue? Well, and, and that's where it was helpful to have the MRI done because Dr. Kaminskis explained to us that um, it, it was things that my mom maybe could have done when she was my age. She smoked for many years. Mm -hmm. In fact, she does not realize it, but I weaned her off of smoking about three months ago because it was getting kind of dangerous mm -hmm. with her smoking in the house. She had high blood pressure and she had high cholesterol. So now knowing what we know, I think there are things that could have been done differently, but it's also up to the individual. For me, it's kind of a relief because I don't smoke, I don't have high blood pressure, and I don't have high cholesterol. So I'm hoping I don't inherit well, that. On that point, a very interesting, and we have some slides to go with this. Uh, actually, what they say is that 
having to care for someone with dementia makes a lot of people sick. Yeah. So you got to be strong, right? Interesting that you say that because I've been trying to find a primary care doctor in Hawaii since I'm here and I'm overdue. And I finally this morning was able to find one that is accepting new patients because with everything I've read, I want to make sure that my husband and I stay healthy while taking care of mom. So let me um, have uh, Christine Payne take us through some of these statistics uh, that I think were provided by the Alzheimer's Association sure. about caregivers. So okay. if we can bring up the first slide, it's about um, how many people are involved with caregiving. And uh, I think she's starting off with the slide with the how long people have been right. going and how much else they're doing. So this data was actually captured through the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey that was done here in Hawaii. So this is local data. Um, and what we found was that of the individuals who identified themselves as a family caregiver of somebody with Alzheimer's or related dementia, 45.6% of them had already been, had been caregiving for at least two years. Um, we also found that those caregivers uh, also managed household care, so things like cleaning, cooking, and miscellaneous chores like that. For the patient? For the patient, yes. 74.5% okay. of them were doing that for their loved one who has dementia. Um, and then 72% of them said they also managed personal care. And so personal care was identified as bathing, toileting, and so forth. So, you know, the duties that they encumber as a family caregiver was across the board. And then what about the numbers of people who are involved in caring? I think that we might have to pull that slide up. Uh, sure. I, I'm curious as to how many people are touched by this. So the number of unpaid family caregivers within the state of Hawaii is 66,000. It's a lot of people. Um, and it's estimated that the total hours of unpaid care provided by those 66,000 individuals is 75 million. And uh, the value of that unpaid care is estimated to be at $944 million. That's a billion dollars. Right. And this last one is very interesting. And so we also identified the, that $45 million is the higher health cost of caregivers. You know, caregivers, we talked a little bit about physical health, but there's also emotional and mental health that has to be factored in. And I think all of those come into play and uh, the cost of caregiving you know, for one's own health is, is also sometimes sacrificed when you're caregiving for a loved one with the disease. In the last slide here, and I'll, I'll talk about this one very quickly, basically of these caregivers, 8.5 report frequent poor physical health and over 12%, nearly 13% end up depressed. Mm -hmm. And on that point, let's move on to another clip. Uh, many of the 66,000 caregivers we're talking about have left their jobs to take care of a parent with Alzheimer's. It's a familiar backdrop when taking into account the impact of this disease on families. Here's another clip from the PBS documentary about caregivers. In this quiet neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri, the Alzheimer's epidemic is a very personal reality. Daisy Duarte spends almost every moment of every day taking care of her mother, Sonia. Okay. I wake her up, I take her to the bathroom, I sit her down, I strip the bed, I strip all her clothes off, I put her in the shower, I shower her. Abre la boca, dame la, la, la lengua, saca la lengua, así, ah, okay? Ponte then I brush her teeth and uh, dress her up, put her on a chair, do her hair and her makeup. But Alzheimer's just, it's a horrible waiting game. You know, it, it hurts to see someone that's so, been, so independent, that's raised three kids. Just see her deteriorate year after year after year. It's an emotional roller coaster. She's very loving, but she's regressing. No, 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 mira, esto, esto pa esto. She hasn't said my name in a long time. Most of the time is when I ask her, who am I? She says, mom. I'm like, I'm not your mom, you're my mom. And then she says, yeah. Jennifer, I know you watched that documentary before. Did that particular piece really resonate with you? Yeah, in fact, I'm trying not to cry right now. Um, I watched it earlier this week. 
I had watched it a couple of months ago when it was on PBS, and that stage seemed so far away at that point. My mom, I don't know if it's because of the vascular dementia, mm -hmm. she just seems to be going downhill very quickly. Last year she was able to drive. She, she shouldn't have been, mm -hmm. but she lived independently in a two-story house. Um, now I have to take her to the toilet. Um, you know, my husband is home taking care of her right now with a neighbor on call in case she needs to go to the toilet. It's very hard. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. It, 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 you, there are days, I remember in the fall before my husband was able to join me here, and he would be the only person, at, I was still able to leave the house then. I had purchased a fall alert pendant. Mm -hmm. I realized after the automatic thing did not work and my mom with the dementia didn't realize that even though I told her to press the button. So I stopped being able to walk up the hill in our neighborhood. But sometimes he was the only person I talked to all day besides my mom. You did mention earlier that you're looking forward to having a care, you do have a caregiver now who comes in. And what's that, how does that work? It's been wonderful. I have to thank my dad many years ago that he purchased long-term care insurance. And we finally met our 100-day elimination period. So what does that mean? It means in order for the policy to kick in and reimburse for your expenses, you have to pay out for 100 days of care. And we're fortunate now because we met the 100 days, and so I have a caregiver come in and it's covered for by long-term care insurance. But I know a lot of people aren't in that position where they can get that kind of relief. Uh, Christine Payne, uh, on these, uh, the subject of services to in-home caregivers, I mean, uh, she has that insurance. Is that a service that's available to many people? Well, I, I think the thing with long-term care insurance is that you have to get it when you're younger before you get the diagnosis. So and a lot of times we have families come to us and it's probably too late. Mm -hmm. But there are in-home care services that are available, some of them. Um, have specials where if your loved one has a form of dementia, they will um, provide some services for free uh, because there are some grants out there that provide for that. So we have an, a number of different companies that provide that service and we give the referrals out um, anytime anybody how much calls. Does it, how much does it cost? Oh, the costs vary, and uh, but it is expensive. Can you give me a general idea? It depends on the level of care that's needed, and so, I mean, it the further along in the disease, the more it's gonna cost uh, because there's things like toileting and bathing uh, that may be, you know, medication um, may be required of the, the position. Even, Leo, for, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, even for a home health aid, if you go through a licensed agency, it's an hourly cost of at least 30 to $35 usually. So, that so a lot of people cannot afford Four or five it. hours is 100 something dollars a day. It could easily be that or more. Uh, Dr. Liao, what are the things that you see that caregivers, sh uh, potential caregivers and current caregivers should know and should be thinking about when they make these decisions about what to do about their family members? What I usually uh, tell my patients, caregivers, is, you know, Alzheimer's doesn't just affect the patient, it affects the whole family. You know, it really, um, uh, it's a disease, um, it really takes a toll, you know, as, especially with uh, Jennifer's story. So the best, uh, I usually tell them, don't forget to take care of yourself, you know, because they often uh, just drop everything. You know, they stop their life and just devote themselves to caring for their mom, their dad, you know, their brother, and they often forget that. So, uh, and, and they feel guilty if they don't. So uh, it, sometimes it takes, you know, somebody else to tell them, hey, it's okay, you know, you need to take a break, you need to, uh, you need to take care of yourself. You know, I, I think that sometimes you'll, you'll get, end up in a place with a family where one person is, you know, of the multiple siblings or whatever, one person, and there's family problems about who's taking care and, and why and so on. Uh, uh, Christine, is that something you end up counseling people on? Do they come to you and they say, I can't get my, everybody's Definitely. too busy. Definitely. I think if, you know, the family dysfunction is even more magnified when you're dealing in a, with a caregiving situation. And we do have a lot of families that come in where they're, you know, one sibling will say, 
oh, I think my brother's living on, at mom's house and he's just taking advantage of her, but then the brother who's living there is like, hey, I'm caregiving for her while I'm staying here and I can't work because I'm caregiving. And so there's a lot of those different dynamics that come into play that makes the situation even harder because you're dealing with not only how to care for your, your loved one with the disease, but you're also fighting other loved ones um, in regards to what's the best type of care to provide. You know, Jennifer, when you started going through this process, what I, I know Dr. Liao was helpful, but what kind of resources were there to help you prepare for what was ahead? I think the best thing um, that I would recommend for anyone going through this is to learn as much as you can. So I contacted the Alzheimer's Association. They have great classes. There's also, with the recognition that people cannot get out to classes, online classes to take. Um, there's the hotline, there's support groups, but also we went, my husband and I were fortunate enough to happen upon a, a class called the Savvy Caregiver. It was a six week, two hour week class. My sister-in-law would come over and watch my mom and it gave my husband and I a really good foundation. Um, and we learned more, just meet mom where she's at. Don't have preconceived notions of how the day's gonna go. Um, I, I just, I think the more people can learn, you know, it's counterintuitive on how you deal with someone with Alzheimer's. You don't um, try to rationalize or reason with them or tell them something's wrong. You just go along with whatever, you know, whatever it is they're thinking. The other night, my mom woke up in the middle of the night and swore someone was ringing the doorbell. And so at four in the morning, the I answered the doorbell. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We and call I them see. therapeutic fibs. Yeah. Oh, therapeutic fibs. i got to remember that line. Um, a, a number of questions have come in uh, from the viewers, and uh, some of them are kind of random, but let's give it a shot. Uh, I, I know that Dr. Uh, Masaki, you and I were talking about this earlier, uh, a little bit about when did we start learning about Alzheimer's, and it says, when was the earliest case of Alzheimer's detected? How does it differ from dementia? If you wouldn't mind, let's start with the first question first. Sure, so Alzheimer's disease was actually discovered in 1906 by Dr. Alzheimer. It was named after him. How nice and, for him. Yes, and actually uh, the original case was a relatively young woman. She was in her early 50s. She developed this very devastating dementia syndrome. He followed her all the way to her death and actually did a brain autopsy on her and found the abnormal proteins in the brain that Dr. Liao mentioned, the plaques and the tangles. So over a hundred years ago, we knew what causes Alzheimer's disease. There was very little research done though until about the 1980s. It was thought that it was a rare disease because most people died uh, in the middle age. You know, I think life expectancy in 1900 was about 45 to 50 years. So most people didn't live long enough to be at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. You know, Dr. Liao, this is another question along those lines. What is the average age at the onset of Alzheimer's? Is the age coming down or are we just living longer? I, I think that pretty much it's clear the older we get, the more likely we are gonna uh, end up with this disease. But the average age, and maybe we should talk a little bit about the differences between early onset Alzheimer's versus later onset. We haven't really talked about uh, hereditary factories, how, how, factors. Sure. How big is heredity and what kind of different things does a heredity produce? Sure, absolutely. Well, we know that genetics play a big role um, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are two types of genetic pathway to Alzheimer's. One, the first one is deterministic genes, which means that if you have the gene, you know, it's almost certain that you're gonna get it. Uh, these patients usually have Alzheimer's very early on, you know, in their 40s and 50s, but these are by far the minority, only less than 5%. The majority of the patients are actually, uh, the 95% are late onset Alzheimer's. Uh, they have them after 65 years old. These are determined by what we call risk genes. You know, you have the gene, your risks are increased, but there are some other environmental factors that play into it. So it's important, uh, you know, to explain that to our patients because I constantly have patients in their 40s and 50s that come in and say, do I have it? Well, let's run the genetic test. You don't have it, you know, uh, so uh, there you have it. Um, when we talk about um, the, something like that where you might actually know it's coming or you might have a sense because you have other family members, 
this question, is there a truth to having people with symptoms or even who are afraid of the disease coming doing puzzles or brain games to delay symptoms or reverse side effects or is that just wishful thinking? Is there anything to that? Yeah, so actually there is some research that shows that the more physically, mentally and socially active you remain, the more likely it is that you'll remain protected from developing Alzheimer's disease. But it's not a, it's not a panacea. It doesn't mean because you do any of these things that it guarantees you will not get the disease. We do tell people after retirement, stay as mentally active as possible. There's a lot of products out there that are being sold as, you know, if you buy this puzzle, you will not get Alzheimer's. I think those are not uh, proven. So I think any type of mental activity, social activity, and physical activity is good for you. I wouldn't recommend one over the other necessarily. I've heard music, though. I mean, music engages a lot of parts of your, that's just one way of being active and being mentally. Absolutely, active. yeah. So it's really a matter of capacity, you mm -hmm. know, so a person with uh, high capacity to begin with, even some decline, you know, they wouldn't manifest the symptoms so early. So we find that patients who are highly educated, there's a high correlation with, uh, they have a, a less incidence of Alzheimer's compared to those with a lower education. So uh, stay active and yes. stay mentally active. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, last question for you. Um, after all this talk about home caregivers and so on, what would you like to see change uh, that in terms of what you've experienced. You seem like you're, you educated yourself, you worked hard, you were able to change your career. You had a lot of abilities in dealing with this. What, do you, what are your concerns about other people who are facing the same issue? I think it's difficult if they don't have the resources. I was really fortunate that I was able to leave my house in Chicago and come and stay here indefinitely. You know, I haven't moved here. I have a house that I'm still paying for in Chicago. Um, but I was able to make that change and lose the income from that. Um, and you know, my mom has the long-term care insurance. So I really feel for those people, the caregivers that don't have those resources, and I hope that they have neighbors or friends or family that can help out because you really do need a break. And there's the Alzheimer's Association. Yep. Um, let's move on now. Not everyone, as we know, has the option of at-home caregiving. Facilities that specialize in taking care of Alzheimer's patients can start at five to $6,000 a month. And there are other reasons why family members, members struggle with the decision to admit a loved one to an Alzheimer's care facility. I, no, I, I was absolutely dumbfounded. It's a loved one. I mean, it's my mom. Uh, no cost should be too high, but you know, it's like, holy crap. We have an all-inclusive price so that whatever we have to do to take care of her, as someone that's involved in admissions, it's very hard for me because I know the, the, the agony that the families go through. How do they come up with $4,000, $5,000, $6,000 a month? Meanwhile, the family is also putting people, kids through college and looking at their own retirement. So it's just this horrible, vicious, the cost is just a horrible, vicious cycle that is, it, it's heartbreaking in some ways. Look, we're, we're privileged to take care of your mom. Okay? But for Rick, the heartbreak so is about more than the cost. Right, and we'll, we'll take care of it. I know. We'll I know. take care of it. I feel a little guilty because this was one of the things my dad did not want to happen. He asked me, I don't know how many times when he was passing that, you know, can you... Can you please make sure that your mom stays in the house as long as we can? We're here for you. Thank you. I just got to get it through my thick head that this is the right thing to do. Uh, Christine uh, Payne with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, how is Hawaii equipped? Uh, in that documentary, there's this beautiful state-of-the-art facility, cost a mint, but it was just really like a Disneyland, lovely thing with lots of nice nooks and places and food, expensive. Mm -hmm. Do we have significant enough facilities for the population we're looking at if, if we needed to, you know, uh, put in nursing homes or these homes? 
Well, I think we do have a substantial number of facilities here in the state, and I know that um, there's many more that are being developed as we speak. Um, so the, I think the issue more, though, is about cost. Um, can families afford the care of putting you know, their loved one in a facility? Because the cost can range you know, from $5,000 to $10,000 a month. And if you don't have long-term care insurance or other you know, um, resources, it can be difficult for a family to figure out how they're going to afford it. Dr. Liao, among your patients, what kind of um, process do they go through when they face this question about whether to put the loved one in a, a facility? It's, it's obviously a very difficult question, you know, and um, they, they always um, uh, struggle with, uh, you know, a lot of um, guilt, first of all, you know, uh, I, I don't want to put mom in there, you know, that's not what she wants, you know, or, uh, but, you know, I always encourage them that, you know, um, you got to take care of yourself and, um, you know, we have wonderful resources in the community like the Alzheimer's Association, um, you know, try to work with the primary care physicians. Uh, they really know the patient's family well. We try to pull them into the player. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, just being there for them during this uh, really um, uh, challenging times, you know. Uh, I think it, sometimes it really takes a team of uh, caregivers to really uh, surround themselves uh, with the patient um, because they really need the care that, that they need at that time. You know, uh, what does the, I'm getting some very specific questions here about this, this exact area, about the resources that are available, I think financial resources. One question, what does Medicare cover, offer? Um, actually, Jennifer, I imagine you've had to go through the, the financial situation. I mean, is there, I know you had long-term care insurance, which is basically providing your the caregiver, but what about Medicare, Medicaid, those sorts of things? Well, they're more the experts. From what I learned um, when my mom was hospitalized a couple of months ago, they have to be hospitalized for three nights, and then Medicare will pay for short-term rehab. So she did go to a facility for six or seven weeks after she had fallen. But fortunately, they found something that could admit her because at first when we took her to the ER, they didn't find anything, and she would be in a facility now because she was not able to walk. Um, now she can walk with some assistance. And this is something that I'm struggling with and will continue to struggle with. I've thought about, you know, should I take her back to the mainland where it's cheaper? However, her short-term memory shot, and she still has some long-term memory, and I think if we can keep her in her house as long as possible, she will be as happy and have as, as good a quality of life as possible. Um, however, if we weren't there, she would be falling every day. You know, Christina, let me come back to this. Uh, we see the seminars for how to get yourself covered by Medicaid, uh, get rid of your assets, the form trusts and all that sort of thing. Is that something that's worthwhile to look into or, or is it by the time someone actually has the disease, it's kind of too late to, to pursue that? I, I think it's, while it's late, there's still some options available to do it after somebody has been diagnosed. But I, I think that the earlier you can plan, the better. And we do try to encourage that um, families do the financial planning as soon, you know, if they haven't done it already, they do it as soon as the diagnosis is given because there's a lot of decisions that have to be made um, and the cost of care is expensive. Whether you keep them in the home or whether you put them in a facility, you know, we often see that it bankrupts families. So I imagine people sell their homes yeah. quite routinely to, to go to an institution. Yeah. I just wanted to point out one thing. Most of dementia care is not covered, especially for long-term care. Most of it is not covered. You have to, Medicare only covers skilled facilities, which means you need to either have some skilled need or need rehab, and it's a limited amount anyway. Once you pass the 100 days that Medicare covers, you're on your own. Most dementia patients need long-term care, not skilled care, and the long-term care is not covered unless you qualify for Medicaid, which means you have to spend down 
most of your assets. I'm feeling like this is really getting kind of depressing, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, here's another question. Does the state or DOH have resources, grants to help support families when a family member needs to give up full-time work to become a caregiver? I know we had Kapuna Care we talked about, but right. that was very limited, even at its most generous, as I mm -hmm. recall. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is a bill that just was passed to Kapuna Care that does a lot for some money, but you, it, in order to be a recipient of it, when the program does roll out, you have to, um, the care, family caregiver has to maintain employment. The whole purpose is so that they can keep their jobs. So if it was in a caregiving situation where you're not, working. you're not working, that's not going to be applicable to you. Um, there are some resources, and that's why I always say contact the, the Alzheimer's Association or, you know, the ADRCs within each of the counties within the state because the I think... ADRC is... Uh, Aging a Disability Resource, resource centers. centers. Those that are, are county agencies. Those are county agencies. I always say that um, those agencies, along with the Alzheimer's Association, we have... A, a better sense of what resources are available and we can direct the families to them. I, I want to do some, uh, again, some of these questions aren't exactly on the theme that we're on at the moment, but they're important questions. Uh, one question we got quite early in the program, and I'm not sure um, wh how this fits in, what is Asperger's syndrome? Is that at all related to dementia? Asperger's is a form of autism. Uh, uh, Asperger's is more of a um, uh, Autistic spectrum disorder, you know, it's, it is a uh, sort of neurologic disorder where the uh, the patient will have, um, you know, behavioral issues, you know. So it's uh, not really related to no, the it's not, yeah. Okay, it's let me, not. okay, I'll move along from there then. Is it true that took turmeric? Turmeric. Turmeric? Yeah. Sorry. I, I don't spend yeah. a lot of time on herb shots. What, what is, is it true that it's known to prevent Alzheimer's? Uh, there's really no specific data that shows that. There are some hints because in some uh, ethnic groups that consume a lot of it, there may be slightly lower rates of it. So I think it's an area that's being studied, but there's no conclusive evidence yet. It's another one of those things where there's so many factors in yes. both environmental, cultural, exactly. and dietary. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's a tough, here's a fun one, I guess. How will the proposed Trump Care Health Care Bill, impact research and the treatment of the disease. And let's just broaden that out a little bit uh, because it's probably not going to come out the way it does, it's proposed now. What are the fears of the folks in your community about the future of the ability to care for this given the attitude of the government as it's being expressed today? Anybody want to take that? Everybody's trying to go, you well, first. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that Alzheimer's Association does on a national level is we advocate uh, in behalf of more funding for research. And so we were um, recently uh, excited about the NIH budget, which was going to have an increase in funding towards research for a cure. Um, and we hope that with the changes that will be going um, will be going through, it will not impact the research funding. Because honestly, in order for us to really deal with this epidemic, we need to find the cure. And that's really where I think the dollars need to be spent. Um, if we don't find a cure, I mean, we're the, t we're the sixth leading killer in the nation right now. We're just going to increase as the number of people affected continue to increase. You know, Dr. Liao is, is involved in that. And I, one thing I'd like to throw at you, though, right before we, I give you that question, um, this is a, a, a caller who says, um, we're wondering if this is just a creation of psychiatrists, we are just talking, or are we just talking about natural aging? Absolutely not, because there is a definitely difference between uh, normal aging, which is speed of processing of the information, as opposed to a patient's Alzheimer's, where there is um, the signals between the brain cells are not getting to each other. You know, so talking about funding, you know, uh, everything that we have, all the approved treatment that we have right now are just masking the symptoms. You know, five medications, so they are not addressing the underlying cause. You know, like Christine said, our best hope really for this disease is to uh, fund the quest for a cure. You know, um, currently we are uh, excited that uh, there are some very good science, very good research going on and uh, some of the research is uh, directed towards disease modifying, uh, addressing, uh, breaking down some of the compounds that clumps uh, so that the amyloid doesn't clump together to become the plaque. 
um, you know, and then some of the medications are also to uh, st inhibits the enzymes that break down the building blocks of the beta amyloid, which is the amyloid precursor protein. Uh, these are the exciting clinical trials that are potentially disease modifying. So I'm really excited about some of the activities and I think this is where um, our best hope is to um, in, in battling this disease. You know, speaking of hope, we have one more quick clip uh, that's based on the fact that if we look ahead 10 years or 20 years, if we still don't have a cure or proven preventive for Alzheimer's, what impact will this disease have on everyone? Here's another clip that after which I will ask for you guys' reactions. Lately, she's been looking in the mirror at herself, trying to recognize herself, I think. So many people have said, put her in a daycare, I'll find a daycare. I said, that would kill her. Now we're considering doing home care, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to go about that. We're trying to get financial things in order and understand what we're playing with. Alzheimer's is the most expensive disease in America. Um, it exceeds the cost of cancer. It exceeds the cost of heart disease. Um, and it's skyrocketing at a rate that you rarely see with a chronic disease. Now, when the number of patients triples in the years ahead, that means that the number of dollars is going to explode as well. And the budget to just take care of Alzheimer's in America will be equal to the defense budget of our country. And most of those costs are going to be borne by the taxpayer, by Medicare and Medicaid, um, about uh, two thirds of the costs. Um, and that's gonna bankrupt the system. I think there's no question that in fact, uh, Alzheimer's will be the financial sinkhole of the 21st century. So it's a huge problem. It's only going to get worse because right now we have no drugs that can stop the progress of this disease. You know, let me ask uh, Dr. Kobomasaki from UH Medical School, what is um, the cost factors of this disease? They, they, it's very scary what they were saying. When they start talking about that, it's not just what it costs for this disease or for people who are trying to care for them. It's rippling out effects, right? Exactly. So somebody who has any form of dementia, it affects every aspect of their care, especially if it's not recognized early. So let's say we have somebody who has a serious memory problem, their family and friends and even their doctors don't recognize it. It affects every other disease that they have. So if they have high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure, whatever, they're not able to take their medications correctly. They actually end up with a lot of crisis care. They end up in the ER man many times, or they've fallen, or they've overdosed on their medications accidentally because they forgot they took it and they take it over and over again. So it affects every other disease as well, not just the memory problems. Uh, Dr. Liao, is there hope? I mean, you, you talked a little bit about, like today, if someone came to you and said, you know, uh, my mother died of Alzheimer's early, you know, and I have the gene, what can you do for that person? Well, I think we're in a very exciting era of uh, research where we are um, beginning to uh, understand that you know, the process of Alzheimer's happens years before they actually lose the memory. You know, so uh, our two challenges, biggest challenges to find a cure is, number one is to look for a better biomarker. For example, uh, diabetes, you can measure the blood sugar, you know. Uh, we don't have a accurate way to measure uh, Alzheimer's. Um, the best method that we have right now is uh, taking spinal fluid from patients to look for CSF uh, amyloid proteins level and tau levels. Um, the second challenge that we have... Before you go on, let me ask this question. You know, how would somebody know that they should go and ask for that kind of a test or that kind of a screening? Absolutely. Uh, for example, one of the clinical trials that we're conducting is specifically looking for patients who doesn't have memory loss, but they have family members with Alzheimer's and they test positive in the genes. They have to have double set of Apple, what we call Apple E4 allele, they have to have strong genetic risk factors, and they have to, in their spinal fluid, they have to have um, showing that they are definitely on track to develop Alzheimer's, even though they are what we call preclinical before they become symptomatic. These are the patients we are very interested in studying because these are the patients that we can really make a difference, you know, uh, in address some of the underlying cause. 
you know, and obviously this is due on a research basis. The challenge is obviously in recruiting patients, you know, so we work with uh, trial match at Alzheimer's Association website, you know, and our clinical research center uh, recruiting patients for such trials. Um, uh, Dr. Masaki, just so that I understand, mm -hmm. again, talking about someone who might be getting it. Yes. Can we do something about it, really? Once you have the diagnosis of dementia, we really don't have very effective treatments, as the documentary showed. So there are some treatments that are available, but all they really do is try and replace some of the chemicals that are missing in Alzheimer's disease. They don't do anything for the underlying pathology, those abnormal proteins and the cell loss, the, the neurons, the brain cells are dying. They don't do anything for that. We still try those medications, though, but we are hoping to get better medications and eventually a cure. Jennifer Jungle, uh, with your with your mom, your family, I, there's one one. There was a note of very great appreciation for you being on this program, you know, and I do appreciate it. Uh, a caregiver writes in, "I found routine helps and a positive activity like music helps my loved one." What kind of things have you done and found that have helped? Maybe both of you. <laughs> we started playing games after dinner, so that is a routine. We never did that before. Um, my mom, I think I previously mentioned she had lost 15 pounds. Since I've been here last August, she's gained over 20 pounds. She enjoys eating, and so I cook things. I try to involve her with the cooking. Um, we learned about this contented involvement in one of the classes that we took. So. I try not to overwhelm her, but I give her a step or two to keep her involved with the cooking. Mm -hmm. She can't stand anymore, so now she does it at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. If it's too much, then, you know, I stop. Um, but I try to keep her involved as much as possible. Um, we've tried the music some. I also, for Mother's Day, got her, it's a fake cat that's battery operated. Oh, yeah. And I thought it'd be too mm -hmm. juvenile. She sleeps with it. She thinks it's real about 90% of the time. Mm. Um, Christine Payne with the Alzheimer's Association, what gives you hope in this, about this disease? I think what gives us hope is the fact that we have been able to advocate for funding and Alzheimer's Association actually is the largest nonprofit funder of research on Alzheimer's disease. So I take great pride in that um, and I think that truly is, you know, as Dr. Liao mentioned, you know, the hope that, that one day we'll have our what we call our first survivor of Alzheimer's disease, and and I think every every failed trial is still a step closer because then we know we're looking in the wrong direction and let's change course. So we are hopeful that we will find a cure. Dr. Liao, uh, in just a, a couple sentences, could you tell me what your hope is? Do you th what's your timeline? Do you think that while we're around, this there'll be something found, or do you think it's quite a few years out? I think we're at least, I would say, at least a, probably about 10 years away. You know, I mean, there are many exciting research going on, but I think we're on the brink of some very exciting research, but we really need patients and volunteers to really help us to understand. And what really inspire me are the patients and the caregiver. They, 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 they inspire us to, to, to do this and, and uh, to be better researchers and physicians. And Dr. Masaki, uh, a last thought in about a sentence. I feel the same way. Uh, the caregivers really put themselves out and it is the hardest job in the world. I have so much respect for all the caregivers who do such a wonderful job. You need a lot of patience and we really appreciate what you do. And we really appreciate you being here and all of you, thank you so much. Mahalo to all of you and all of our audience for joining us tonight. And we'd like to thank our guests, Christine Payne from the Alzheimer's Association Aloha Chapter, Dr. Kamal Masaki, Department of Geriatric Medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine, Dr. Corey Liao from Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience Center, and caregiver Jennifer Jungle. Thank you. Next week on Insights, join us at a special 8.30 time following the broadcast premiere of Ku Kanaka, Stand Tall, from filmmaker Marlene Booth. Kanalu Young was just 15 years old when in a split second he became a quadriplegic. The accident left him bitter and angry with little hope for his future. This took place in the 1970s when the Hawaiian Renaissance was taking root. 
Filmmaker Marlene Booth said it was as though what had been a Hawaiian resident, resident renaissance on a statewide scale became Kanalu's renaissance. Following the premiere of Kukanaka, we have a special insights with guests who also survived personal tragedy and discovered a new passion in their lives. We will now leave you with a clip from Kukanaka, Stand Tall. I'm Daryl Huff from Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho. the anniversary of the insurgency against our queen and the participation by the United States in the loss of our direct government over ourselves. Kanalu is right there on that front line, exactly where he belonged, right there near the center of the picture, in front of television cameras, in front of thousands and thousands of people. He was in that front line because he belonged there and everybody knew that the future of the Hawaiian community, the caring for that historical memory, it was in that frail body and very, very powerful mind. And I do believe that in his heart, Kanalu saw his own life and the life of our people as mirror images of each other.